This morning, we're fortunate to have with us Greg McGarrian, professor of law. Greg was educated at Yale, where I note he was an English major, and at Michigan, where he took degrees in law and public policy and served as editor-in-chief of the Law Review. He clerked at the US District Court in Washington, and then for Justice John Paul Stevens at the Supreme Court. After practicing with Jenner and Block in DC and teaching at Villanova Law School, he joined us here at Washington University in 2008. Professor McGarrian is well known nationally and internationally for his work on free speech, the law of politics, law and religion, and for a variety of topics in constitutional law. He's published widely in legal journals, presents frequently at conferences, and he's taught as a visitor at universities in Canada, China, and Holland. During the nomination process for Supreme Court Justice Elena Kagan, he led the American Bar Association team that examined her work and evidently found it pretty good. We are delighted to have him here this morning speaking on the topic of radical ideas and constructive discourse in free speech theory. Greg? Well, thank you, Bob, and, and thanks for the opportunity to, to do this, and thanks to all of you for coming out on a Saturday morning. Um, I, I think tolerance is a really great theme for a lecture series from the standpoint of the speakers because it makes it inherently kind of churlish for the audience to be too hard on the speaker. Because if you come after me, I just say, hey, practice tolerance, okay? Uh, but I'm, I'm gonna try not to, take, not to take too much advantage of that built-in benefit. Um, let me tell you what I, what I wanna do. There's, there's a bunch of moving parts to what I wanna talk to you about today. So I'll give you the overview and, and then get down to the details. Uh, I wanna, introduce what I think is a very important uh, dichotomy in the area that I primarily study, uh, free speech law under the First Amendment. And it's a dichotomy between what I'm going to call uh, pluralism and integrationism as theories or goals in First Amendment law and theory. I'm going to explain what I mean by those terms, flesh them out a little bit, and then I'm going to talk to you about three relatively recent Supreme Court uh, decisions, all decisions of the court under Chief Justice John Roberts over the past five years that provide good uh, uh, vehicles for examining and, and, and testing and trying out this dichotomy as a way of thinking about First Amendment law. So I'll tell you about the cases in some detail, work, work through them under this integrationist versus pluralist rubric. And then I'm going to complicate matters a little bit and explain why even with this somewhat helpful tool for looking at these cases, this dichotomy I'm talking about, we're still going to be left a little bit high and dry, or at least I'm left a little bit high and dry for reasons I'll explain in terms of evaluating and critiquing these decisions, ultimately deciding what we think of them. And so I'm going to suggest at that point that we need uh, a further analytic tool. We need a normative standard for navigating between or toggling between the two sides of this pluralist integrationist dichotomy, I'm going to propose a, a sort of normative idea that I think is, is valuable and important. And using that, I'm going to work through the cases, tell you what I think for whatever that's worth, uh, and hopefully give you some, uh, some good red meat to, uh, to chew on and, and things to throw back at me. So uh, without further ado, I am um, the title of my talk, as you know, is Radical Ideas and Constructive Discourse in Free Speech Theory. And, and that title was the product of literally tens of seconds of careful contemplation uh, back when Bob told me when he set me up for this gig, which I feels like it was sometime in late 2007 that we first talked about this, uh, told me that I needed a title. So I, okay, well, I don't have the talk, so title, okay, that, that should work. I mean, that sounds like a, a talk I'd like to give, so, you know, I'll give it. Um, so I I'm, I'm, I'm think I'm gonna be true to the title, but let me sort of explain a little bit, take off from the title and build up this, this kind of theoretical dichotomy economy that I want to talk to you about. In free speech law and in free speech theory, and in, in at least writings in the US about the First Amendment, there are in various forms, uh, there are various forms of, of, of a, a dichotomy and opposition that keeps coming up over and over again. Uh, the simplest instance of this dichotomy is when we look at explanations that people offer for why we have constitutional free speech protection. There are two, there are a lot of, a lot of answers to that question, but there are two theories that seem to kind of recur and they're sort of posed in opposition to one another. Some people say, well, we have constitutional free speech protection uh, for the sake of the individual, for the sake of individual fulfillment uh, and, and, and self-development. So it's a very individualist notion of free speech. And then there are other people who will say, now the big point of free speech is in some sense collective. And, and usually the explanation that people offer is it's about 
uh, self-government in a, a democratic political order, that we need free speech so that we can govern ourselves, we can talk about politics. So you've got this sort of individualist idea and this more collectivist idea. Another iteration of this same basic opposition comes from a, a brilliant First Amendment theorist, a guy named Robert Post at Yale. Um, he wrote a wonderful article some years back uh, where he talked about how First Amendment law and free speech theory more generally require two different components that are kind of opposed to one another. One component is freedom. We need to be able to speak freely to uh, throw out uh, uh, radical, uh, unpopular, maybe even offensive ideas. But on the other hand, we need some structure of what he refers to as civility norms. We need to be able to talk to each other. We need to be able to understand each other. At the simplest level, we need a common language uh, that we can all understand, or common languages. He's not like an English first guy. But so, you know, we need the ability to understand each other literally, and we need to be able to talk to each other uh, in, in terms that we can all relate to and accept. And Post comes to the conclusion, sort of working through this idea, that these are just elements of, of a working system of free expression that are necessary, they're in opposition to one another, and they're uh, constantly in play and constantly in, in, uh, in conflict. And one more variation on the same theme, it's a broader uh, version out of liberal political theory, or I should say, I guess, Western political theory, because liberal is one of the operative words I'm going to use. We often talk about an opposition between communitarian ideals and liberal ideals. Communitarian being, hey, let's all work together, let's work toward common goals. Liberal ideals being classically the idea of, of respect for individual freedom and uh, individual initiative. You look at all of these different versions uh, in First Amendment theory, free speech theory, and, and political theory more generally, and you get an idea of, of what I want to talk about today. So I'm going to, just for the heck of it, because I'm an academic, use entirely different terminology to talk about roughly the same thing. But I want to isolate this dichotomy in, in First Amendment theory. So I'm going to use the terms pluralist and integrationist. When I talk about pluralist ideas in free speech theory, I'm talking about the notion uh, that we need to let everyone, uh, individuals, and potentially uh, groups within civil society express themselves in the way they want to, develop their own ideas, uh, throw out, again, radical, offensive, uh, difficult, challenging ideas. And then the integrationist notion is, is sort of the opposing notion, um, uh, the notion that, hey, in order to have a working society, a, a working system of free expression within our society, uh, we need, again, to be able to talk to one another. We need to be able to integrate our ideas to come to some common understanding to work toward a, a sense of the common good. So I, I want to organize my whole discussion today around those two ideas and the way that they differ from one another. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive. They're big, broad ideas that can, in some sense, coexist. And in fact, part of my big point here today is that they're ideas that must, to some extent, coexist, um, even as they're in opposition with one another. And that's part of the difficulty uh, that I want to get into as, as we analyze some, some of the cases that I want to talk about. So, as we say in uh, the law biz, let's get down to cases. Um, over the past several years, uh, since Chief Justice John Roberts took over uh, uh, leading the Supreme Court, there have been a number of really interesting, important First Amendment cases that I've, I've looked into and studied at some length, because that's what I do. And I want to talk to you today about three of them, three cases that I think uh, provide especially rich and fruitful avenues for applying, examining, and ultimately kind of breaking apart and, and, and critiquing this notion I put out on the floor, this opposition between pluralist and integrationist ideas. Um, the three cases are Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project, uh, Citizens United versus FEC, which you probably have heard of if you, if you don't know about the others, and then a case called Christian Legal Society versus Martinez. They're all very different kinds of cases. They come out in different ways. They're interesting juxtaposed against one another. So I want to talk through the cases, uh, give you a sense of what they're about generally, and then try to frame them in terms of this pluralist versus integrationist idea. Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project, case from a few years ago, and the basic setup is this. You've got a, a, a few different uh, humanitarian human rights uh, organizations, uh, not the biggies, but, but sort of smaller operators, and they want to do something in their own way, in their own fashion, to try to combat the problem of, of terrorism and, and uh, deal with the whole phenomenon of the war on terror. What they want to do is be in contact with some organizations abroad uh, 
uh, that the State Department has labeled as terrorist organizations. And the particular organizations at issue in this case were the Tamil Tigers in Sri Lanka and the uh, Kurdistan Workers Party. These are both entities that the State Department has officially identified as terrorist organizations. Now, what these humanitarian groups want to do is use their know-how to talk to these putative terrorist organizations about how they can basically work and play well with others. Here's how you can address your grievances uh, through peaceable means. Here's how you can make your case to international bodies. Uh, here's how you can do things that do not require violence in order to try to address your deeply held concerns. Well, there's a law on the books, a federal law, that prohibits anyone, any American, from giving material aid to terrorist organizations, as designated by the State Department. And the State Department has further construed the term material aid to mean, and ultimately Congress makes very clear, that the term material aid includes uh, intellectual expertise of any kind. So the humanitarian groups here, the plaintiffs in the case, have a concern that if we do what we want to do, talk to these uh, groups about how to solve their problems peaceably, we're going to be in violation of this law. So they go to court and ask for a declaratory judgment, a judgment in, 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 uh, before the fact that if they do what they want to do, they won't be arrested for it. It goes all the way up to the Supreme Court, and ultimately the Supreme Court upholds the federal law that effectively bars these groups from doing what they want to do. Now, let me talk about this case for a moment in, term, in, in these terms that I introduced a, a moment ago, pluralist versus integrationist. Here's sort of one way I think you can read this case that's interesting and, and helpful. On one side, you've got a pluralist interest that's basically advanced by the humanitarian groups. They're saying, we have a distinctive, independent, uh, maybe radical idea about what constitutes uh, good policy about how uh, groups should talk to each other about divides, about how we should deal with the notion that there are groups out there that are our enemies, how we address that conflict and that concern. In a, in a broad sense, these groups want to define uh, national identity and national security in their own way and view it in their own way and use free expression uh, as a way of sort of navigating the shoals of national security and national identity. So that is, is what I would call a pluralist interest, that we've got a somewhat idiosyncratic uh, approach that certain people, groups, want to take to a, a big problem, ultimately a, a, a big concept of, of national identity, national security. On the other side, you've got the government advancing what I would call an integrationist interest. The government certainly in this case is not saying uh, in court, we don't care about free expression. Government never says that. Um, and sometimes they really mean that they don't care about, that they, that, that they actually care about free expression. So I'm willing to give them the benefit of the doubt here and, and say that uh, the government here uh, believes sincerely that it is trying to honor the uh, values of free expression, but this is uh, an area, this area of national security, where it just goes too far to allow people to make up their own rules. That there are certain boundaries uh, defined most vividly perhaps by threats to the nation, to national security, where the government has uh, power and an obligation on behalf of the people to make decisions about uh, how collectively we are going to view a certain kind of problem. Uh, national security is often a framework for this kind of claim by the government, uh, and that's really what happened in this case. And again, the court uh, very strongly bought into the government's idea and said, yeah, we care about free speech too, but we think that allowing this sort of uh, uh, radical self-definition of what constitutes a national security threat and what doesn't, how we're going to deal with something that the government has termed a national security threat, the court says that goes too far. As I talk about these cases, one thing I want to do is try to put them in a little, a little bit of, of broader context. I think, I hope it's interesting to hear about more recent decisions a little bit ripped from today's headlines. But I also want to demonstrate how these cases aren't overly idiosyncratic. So with Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project, they're very strong echoes of a whole line of cases that really were the crucible of First Amendment law beginning in uh, the World War I era and really leading up through uh, the 1950s and into the 1960s, dealing with speech by communists and other radicals, but ultimately mostly communists. And the big problem that these cases presented paint with a broad brush, is all right, communism is this, this vast international 
conspiracy. There are communist agents in the United States, which was true to a certain extent. It presents an existential threat to the United States. So how can we allow the First Amendment to protect speech uh, that is aimed at ultimately destroying our system uh, and that might actually threaten to do so to some greater or at least lesser extent? And the court really went around and around on this for a while. There were a number of cases uh, up until the 1950s where the court did not, where the court basically said the First Amendment doesn't protect communist expression. Uh, leaders of the Communist Party get together and advocate the violent overthrow of the government. They don't do anything about it. They just say, this would be great, we should do this. Uh, and the court says the First Amendment doesn't protect that. Ultimately, the court reversed that idea and said, we have to uh, allow for radical expression even when it's, it, it poses this sort of existential threat. Uh, but it took the court a long time to get there. And there are echoes, I think, in Holder versus Humanitarian Law Project of that, of that earlier era and that earlier problem. The problem now is, is terrorism, as defined by the State Department. The problem then was communism. All right, so that's Holder. That gives us, we see in the result in Holder, a victory for what I'm calling the integrationist value, the integrationist perspective. The court holds uh, for the government and rejects the First Amendment claim of the uh, humanitarian groups. The second case, and, and I'm going to, by the way, return to these cases for a little bit more uh, slicing and dicing, but I want to give you the basics first and, and sort of lay out the analysis in the terms that I've uh, described it. The second case that I want to talk to you about is the one that, that many of you, most of you, have probably know something about, Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. This, of course, is the uh, uh, giant uh, campaign finance case of the Roberts Court era. Uh, in the uh, McCain-Feingold uh, campaign finance law several years back, one of the provisions prevents uh, corporations and also unions from uh, broadcasting what are generally referred to as issue advertisements. Uh, advertisements that, that, that don't talk about a candidate but talk about an issue. Uh, you can't broadcast those under McCain-Feingold within a certain range of the election because the notion is we've got campaign finance uh, laws uh, and, and campaign regulations that prevent certain kinds of spending on direct candidate advocacy within a certain range of the election. McCain-Feingold says, yeah, these issue ads basically serve the same purpose even if you're saying, uh, if, you're, if you're not saying uh, vote for Romney because he uh, supports over repealing Roe versus Wade. You can still run a commercial that says, "Repeal Roe versus Wade. It's a good idea. Call President Obama and tell him you think that that's a good idea." So it's this. It's a sort of workaround that people have been using uh, around other campaign finance laws. McCain-Feingold tried to fix this. Supreme Court gets the case, and not only do they strike down the particular provision of McCain-Feingold that prohibits corporations and unions from broadcasting these issue ads within X days of a, an election. The court reaches into the background law that McCain-Feingold was supplementing and says, in fact, we're going to strike down the prohibition on allowing uh, on, on corporations and unions doing direct candidate advocacy within X period of an election. We're going to establish a very broad principle that the First Amendment prohibits the government uh, from limiting what anybody can do, spend, uh, in, in, in what we call independent advocacy. That is, these aren't contributions that corporations and unions are making to candidates. The corporation, say, is making its own uh, ad or making its own film, supposedly not in consultation with the candidate. This is known as independent advocacy, and the court in, in uh, Citizens United basically says, First Amendment prohibits constraints on independent advocacy. The effect of this, uh, as we saw in the recent national election, is that now corporations and unions are free to spend on their own doing independent advocacy as much money as they want to in support of or in opposition to uh, a particular candidate for national office. This decision got a lot, of, uh, a lot of press, a lot of play, and it's, to be sure, a very important decision. But it's also only the latest uh, uh, iteration of what has been a very important area of First Amendment doctrine and First Amendment conflict for quite a while, just trying to hash out uh, the issue of campaign finance and to what extent we're going to allow Congress at the federal level and state legislatures as well at the state level to control or regulate the use of money in politics. I want to suggest, again, that it, it, it can be helpful 
at least to some extent, to look at this conflict, this problem broadly, and the particular problem in Citizens United, through this uh, lens that I've set up of, of pluralism versus integrationism. So here's how I see those ideas playing out in Citizens United. Uh, once again, the challengers to the law, the corporation that brought the case, uh, Citizens United, that wanted to, uh, made a, a film a critical of Hillary Clinton, this was back before the 08 uh, general election when, when Clinton and Obama were, were fighting. Clinton looked like she was gonna be the nominee. So Citizens United had made this, I think it was called Hillary the Movie, that was very critical of, of, of Hillary Clinton and they wanted to run this thing. They're raising uh, the pluralist interest. They're saying we and anybody else should be free to uh, expend money in campaigns in any way we want to. That is uh, a fulfillment of the First Amendment's promise of uh, unchecked, uh, disaggregated expression. Uh, if you've got the capacity to be able to, to speak, to get your message out in one way or another, the dictate of the First Amendment is that the government shouldn't be able to prevent you from doing that. So that's basically the pluralist claim that, that Citizens United is making on behalf of corporations uh, everywhere and, and unions everywhere. Uh, the government, once again, is, is sort of here cast in the role uh, or raising the integrationist interest. The idea that, look, we're trying to run, this is, I think, the government's, the best formulation of the government's argument as I see it. We're trying to run an electoral system here. We're trying to sustain our political order. Uh, and in order to do that, there are desirable features of an electoral system that Congress in its discretion should be able to create or dictate. And one of those is that we should have a, a system for regulating money in politics that discourages the danger of corruption. Now, the notion of corruption is very important legally in Citizens United because for a long time, the Supreme Court has held that the only legitimate interest or in the terminology of the case, the only interest that's sufficiently compelling to justify constraints on money in politics is a concern about corruption. The court has rejected out of hand the idea that a campaign finance regulation can be justified because the government wants to level the playing field, give everybody a chance to participate in the electoral discussion. That's an argument that a lot of people make. It's an argument that I make, um, but the court rejected it a long time ago. So you can look at the government's integrationist position either at face value, we're concerned about corruption here and we think that we should have a regulatory check on that uh, as a way of ensuring a good system that works for everybody. Or you can look, I think, beneath the surface of any argument made on behalf of campaign finance regulations and acknowledge that really that equalization idea, let everybody have a voice, even though the court has rejected it, is a big driving force, a big driving theme behind what the uh, behind what the government wants to do when it regulates campaign finance. All right, so uh, here again, the court uh, holds again upholds. Uh, pardon me, strikes down the uh, uh, the laws in question. Strikes down the law before it and some other stuff for good measure. Uh, so here, uh, in contrast to Holder, we have a victory for the pluralist idea, for the pluralist position. Uh, and not coincidentally for the First Amendment claim. So again, Holder, humanitarian groups may not decide for themselves that they want to uh, talk to the terrorists about playing nice, so that's a, a victory for the integrationist idea. Now, in uh, Citizens United, we get a victory for the pluralist idea. Right, one more case I want to tell you about, a very different kind of case, called Christian Legal Society versus Martinez. Uh, this is a First Amendment case. It isn't quite directly a free speech case. It falls more into the category that the First Amendment refers to as freedom of assembly and that we colloquially talk about and the court has talked about for a long time as the freedom of expressive association. So here's what was going on in this case. University of California, Hastings College of Law has a regulation, public university, has a regulation that says uh, student organizations that get university sponsorship have to allow any student to join the organization if the student wants to. You have to take all comers. So it's known as the all comers policy. The Christian Legal Society chapter at uh, UC Hastings uh, College of Law says we have Christian values and one of the things that those values uh, require us to do is to uh, morally reject and disdain what we consider immoral lifestyles. So anyone who joins our group has to adhere to and acknowledge agreement with 
those principles. And one of those principles is uh, that gay relationships are immoral and that, that gay sex is immoral. So if you're going to join us, you have to adhere to those principles and acknowledge them and honor them. Now, this isn't, strictly speaking, a prohibition on gays and lesbians joining the Christian Legal Society. But of course, in effect, it's going to make it uh, uh, virtually impossible for any non-celibate gay or lesbian person to uh, uh, join the group. Non-celibate, and I, I guess you would also have to sort of reject your own uh, identity in this respect. So we get a big throwdown between the Christian Legal Society and the university. The university uh, says, Christian Legal Society, if you're going to adhere to that requirement, we're not going to sponsor you anymore. We're not going to allow you to call yourself the University of California Hastings College of Law chapter of the Christian Legal Society. And there wasn't sort of existential danger to the group involved in terms of, of money here. I mean, it's a, basically a discussion and advocacy group. But whatever material support is helpful to have from the university, meeting space being a big one, we're not going to give you that either. Uh, the Christian Legal Society brings a First Amendment claim under this principle uh, uh, generally referred to as the freedom of expressive association. They say this uh, uh, the university, by rejecting our ability to uh, define our group in the way that we want to, is uh, violating our right to expressive association. Now, one, just one little thing to get out of the way. You may think, well, gosh, that's a First Amendment claim about the denial of a subsidy. Doesn't seem like anybody has a right to a subsidy. But in fact, there's a lot of law on the books that establishes that when the government uh, decides to hand out a certain kind of benefit, particularly when the government decides to uh, create or, or give out some sort of resources that, that allow you facilitate your free expression, the government generally can't do that in a biased way. So the claim essentially that the Christian Legal Society is making is, you know, we acknowledge that the government doesn't have to give any student group uh, endorsement or meeting space or anything else. But once the government in the form of the university decides to do that, decides to give out this resource, they can't do it in a way that violates our, uh, uh, that violates our uh, uh, First Amendment rights and that, that discriminates against our particular point of view. All right, let me do the same song and dance that I've done with the other two cases. I promise this is the last one. So pluralism versus integrationism. This is actually the case that led me to, to sort of think about First Amendment law in, in these, using these particular words, these particular terms. Uh, because this is a case where the government's position is, is more obviously and quite literally integrationist. The pluralist position of the Christian Legal Society is once again, um, uh, they wouldn't use this phrase, I don't think, but let a thousand flowers bloom. Let, uh, let there be all kinds of organizations and individuals with all kinds of points of view to the extent the government is going to foster uh, speech, foster expression, expressive association, uh, let it do so in an unbiased way so that groups with all kinds of perspectives, whether uh, consistent with majority views or offensive to majority views, uh, conventional or radical, are going to be out there available in public discourse. University takes, again, I think very literally an integrationist position. They say, look, we think there are certain values based on our sense of our educational mission that it is right for us and even important for us to uh, present and promote as universal values. Well, we we sh certainly think people should disagree about a lot of things and that we should foster that disagreement. But the question here is a question of basic human dignity and equal citizenship. Uh, people should not be excluded from university-sponsored, university-fostered activities by virtue of their identity. And we, the university, think that's basically what's going on when any group excludes uh, gays and lesbians, just as we think that's what's going on if a group were to exclude people based on race or based on gender. Uh, and there are earlier Supreme Court cases dealing with exclusions based on, on race and gender that, that, that sort of follow this script. So the university says, we think it is appropriate and, and proper within our educational mission to put limited, broad restraints on what groups that use our name can do based on these sort of certain you know, universal principles, human dignity, equal citizenship. So we want everybody to have a certain amount of, a certain common ground. And part of that common ground is you can't exclude anybody based on identity. Uh, it's interesting here, too, I just want to put this in a little bit of context. Uh, there had been earlier cases in the Supreme Court that raised similar kinds of issues, and earlier cases that cut both ways. In the uh, early 60s, uh, 
the court decided a couple of cases involving efforts by southern uh, municipal and state governments to intimidate civil rights organizations like the NAACP. Uh, groups were asking for the NAACP's uh, membership records. And in those cases, the court held, you can't do that. That is an affront to this group's ability to associate for expression, because obviously what the governments were trying to do in those cases was use the membership list to harass and intimidate members of these politically unpopular organizations. On the other hand, flip side of, of past precedent, there's a case uh, involving the, the JCs, the Junior Chamber of Commerce out of the Twin Cities in Minnesota. JCs had a men only policy. This was back in the early 80s. Uh, some women challenged this, and, and well, they, actually, that's not right. Uh, the, there's a municipal, I can't remember if it was a municipal or state ordinance that said you got to allow women in. The JCs challenged this, took it up to the Supreme Court, and the court said, no, you can't exclude people based on gender. So there are precedents cutting both ways. Uh, when you're contemplating how the court should come out in uh, Christian Legal Society versus Martinez. The way the court does come out is they uphold the university's policy. They say, consistently with the university's argument, what we got here is the university giving out expressive resources, so to speak, uh, and it's not doing so in a viewpoint biased way. The all comers policy, uh, by definition, is about as non-viewpoint biased as you can get. Everybody gets to play, everybody gets to participate. It's not a, uh, an anti-religious policy or an anti-Christian policy. It's an anti-discrimination policy uh, that applies equally to any form of discrimination, anybody who wants to discriminate. So it's not viewpoint discriminatory, it's within the university's discretion. And like all of these cases, well, less, less so Holder, but, but certainly like Citizens United, this is a hotly contested decision, five to four sharp di disagreements among the justices. So here, once again, as in Holder, we get a victory for the integrationist position. So what do we see so far from these cases? I, I hope that the terminology, this, this pluralist versus integrationist terminology uh, dichotomy that I've introduced is a little bit helpful in absorbing what, for many of you, probably is your first exposure to these decisions. It's one way uh, of kind of, again, a lens through which you can view these cases and, and get at least some sense of what's going on. Now we see that the court is not consistently wedded to one side of this dichotomy or the other. And that's interesting uh, as, as an initial observation. But let me, let me use my own perspective on this, and I'm going to get more uh, opinionated and, and more uh, subjective to complicate matters further and, and, and suggest what might be a little bit of a puzzle uh, about this integrationist versus pluralist framework. Uh, I think that in all likely, well, I think that, that, that Holder and Citizens United were both decided wrongly. And I'm really conflicted about Christian Legal Society versus Martinez. Now, unless I'm just being completely incoherent and scattershot, which is always possible, but let's you know indulge me for a minute. That's a puzzle, because what I'm saying is, okay, here you got Holder, which uh, strikes the balance in favor of integrationism. You've got Citizens United, which strikes the balance in favor of pluralism. And I'm saying they're both wrong. Uh, which seems inconsistent on my part, and, and, and that seems, you know, since the Supreme Court is the Supreme Court, that's a bigger problem than inconsistency on the court's part. They can be inconsistent if they want to be. I've got to convince you guys that I'm saying something sensible up here. And I'm telling you I'm conflicted uh, about Martinez. So what I want to do with, with the remainder of my time here is, is work through sort of my critiques of these decisions. Uh, first explain the basis that I have for critiquing these decisions. And, and what I want to suggest is that even with this useful descriptive dichotomy between uh, uh, pluralism and integrationism, we need something else. Any of us need another piece if we're going to make sort of uh, determine our own views on, on these cases and how we think they came out, how we think they should come out. I'm going to suggest that that necessarily means we need a normative uh, uh, angle. We need a normative standard for figuring out uh, what's going on here. And that may be a little bit provocative, because in the classic understanding of, of uh, courts and judges and what they're supposed to do, they're not supposed to be normative. They're supposed to apply the law, call balls and strikes, as Chief Justice Roberts said in his confirmation hearing. I'm going to suggest that that's essentially impossible, that uh, at least, well, maybe, maybe Supreme Court justices can just isolate themselves uh, and, and, and sort of put those thoughts aside, but at least for any of us who might be interested in deciding what we think about these cases, I don't think there is uh, 
possibly a, a right answer, an answer that will satisfy all reasonable people. I think we're going to have normative disagreements, and I'm going to throw out my normative take on this stuff as, as uh, at least a, a starting point for discussion. So let me return to my sort of root discussion for a minute of the pluralist integrationist dichotomy. We see in the cases that I've discussed these two ideas poised against one another. And that's not surprising. That's how, how court cases work. Courts are supposed to uh, settle cases, decide controversies. So it's possible to do what I did and, and, and sort of say, OK, here's where the pluralist interest is. Here's where the integrationist interest is. And at the end of the day, somebody's got to win. But that doesn't mean, as a theoretical matter, that one or the other of these values is right. You know, we, we have versions of the argument that, that suggest that kind of outcome. We have people who identify themselves as communitarians and people who identify themselves as liberals. And they say, generally, communitarianism is, communitarianism is right. Generally, liberalism is right. But in the context of First Amendment law and free speech theory, you can't really do that. And, and here's why. And I, I think it goes back, I mentioned Robert Post's formulation of, of this problem. What, what Post says, and I think it's very, a point very well taken, is if you care about free expression, even if you're a hardcore civil libertarian, you actually have to care about both of these values, these values that I'm now referring to as, as pluralism and integrationism. It's not like if you just run the table on behalf of pluralism, if pluralism always wins, that's going to be your optimal system of free expression. Because the insight that Post gives us is if you do that, if, if you always strike the balance in favor of uh, freedom, autonomy, the individual claim, the, the, the stone in the pond, you're going to lose that dimension of civility norms. And that's not an anti-free speech principle, not in the way Post frames it, in the way I'm framing it. That's something that you actually need in order for people to have any kind of a conversation. And if you think that the First Amendment is directed toward uh, if you think it's purely formal, the First Amendment just means the government can't do anything about speech, then maybe you strike the balance that way. Or what I think is the same thing, if you believe that an acceptable bottom line for a system of free expression is cacophony and, and uh, just people shouting over each other and, and, and flinging verbal feces at each other, then you're fine. But if you believe, as I do, and as a fair number of people do, that the First Amendment has a, a constructive purpose, that it's meant to facilitate some sort of coherent, meaningful discourse for whatever reason, self-development, politics, whatever, then you can't just say pluralism should always win. You're going to recognize that for the sake of meaningful freedom of expression, you also have to have this integrationist dimension. So in evaluating, for example, the Supreme or significant example, the Supreme Court's efforts to, to uh, uh, reconcile these two ideas, we need some sort of standard to tell us how do we oscillate between these two values? How do we choose in any given case which of these values should prevail? And that's where I think we need necessarily a normative standard. I mean, there's no golden mean. There's no, as far as I've ever been able to tell, no absolute that everybody agrees upon. So here's the normative standard I'm going to advocate and throw out. I think that what we should pursue when we do First Amendment law, when courts adjudicate First Amendment disputes, is what I will call dynamic public discourse. And what I really mean by that is I think the most important thing that freedom of expression does is to facilitate, enable uh, change, enable social change. It is a way of uh, pushing back against the status quo. Now, of course, you can speak in favor of the status quo in the course of a, uh, a political discussion, say, and that's important and that's meaningful and that should be protected. But I'm saying the most significant thing that freedom of expression, constitutional protection for expression, does for us is it gives us a mechanism within a pluralistic, hopefully peaceful society, gives us a mechanism for potentially broad, potentially radical change. It's the way that you get ideas into public discourse. Now, those may be political ideas directly. Um, we should change what we're doing about immigration. Or they may be ideas about more uh, personal, more individuated values that ultimately have big social consequences, like the gay rights movement, which didn't start out as a political phenomenon, started out as very much a, a sort of personal defense of identity, uh, wasn't even thought of as politically salient for a long time, and as we know now, has, has emerged as a, a big political issue. So I, I want a, a, a system, a, a rule, for First Amendment adjudication that basically asks the question, as to any given case, which 
value, pluralism or integrationism, will best serve, will best advance the notion of dynamic public discourse, the notion that we want to protect uh, and foster the ability of, of, of speech by anybody to promote uh, change. That's my, that's my norm. That's, that's, that's what I'm selling up here. So let me use that norm to go back in and explain to you in what I hope will be a coherent way, at least on its own terms, why I think both Holder and Citizens United were wrong and why I'm really, really conflicted about, uh, uh, about Martinez. And I'll do that and then I will uh, stop begging your indulgence and we can talk about all this stuff. All right, let's go back to Holder. Uh, in Holder, the interest, of course, that the government is asserting is national security. And that, to any civil libertarian, is sort of a, uh, a danger sign. I mean, obviously, everybody pretty much agrees that national security is, is, is a value, is a meaningful concern uh, at the core of the government's function. What we disagree about often is, is how far, and we've talked about this a lot in, in, the, in the years since the 9-11 attacks especially, how we should strike the balance between national security and liberty. And I think that Holder illustrates exactly the kind of point at which we should strike the balance in favor of liberty, in favor of what I'm calling the pluralist value, uh, because it involves speech. It is one thing in a climate of concern about national security to tolerate action uh, that might have the consequence, and I mean action in contrast to speech, that might have a consequence of destabilizing national security. I think you can make a pretty good case, although I don't agree with all of it, a pretty good case for a lot of what the government has done to uh, uh, prevent material physical actions that threaten national security. You know, airport security uh, may not be effective, may be uh, a violation in some ways of privacy rights. Like I said, I don't agree with all of it, but you can at least see the, the, the sort of baseline case that the government makes for why this is necessary. It's speech. The reason we, one of the big sort of reasons, underlying practical reasons we protect speech is that it isn't inherently as threatening as action, but it presents a great possibility, again, for, for foment, for change, uh, at, at a lower cost to risk. Unfortunately, it's also a really easy thing to regulate. It's also a really easy thing to target for the government because speech by its nature is sort of out there in the open. Um, if you're talking, you know, somebody hears you or somebody can hear you. So that's, that's why we have a lot of First Amendment law and a lot of First Amendment disputes. In this case, uh, I think you've got these organizations, rightly or wrongly, you, know, you don't have to necessarily like what they're doing, but they're taking a, again, a relatively low risk approach to uh, a major problem. And, and again, there's an echo here of the communist speech cases, the sort of depths of the communist speech cases where the court said, we're not gonna protect communist expression. Well. The big case that, that held that, a case called Dennis versus United States, was, was just suffused with fear by, by eminent Supreme Court justices, fear that the international communist conspiracy could overwhelm us. And in retrospect, although we have learned that you know, there were sleeper agents and there were ways in which uh, uh, communist nations were, were pretty effectively undermining some of what our government was doing, the notion that the international communist conspiracy was ever gonna overwhelm the United States in, in retrospect is somewhat implausible. I mean, we, we know more now than we knew then, but even looking back at the arguments made then on their own terms, uh, there was a, a, a certain measure of, of exaggeration, shall we say. And I think it's fair to posit that the uh, problem of terrorism, so-called today, is less dangerous to our nation uh, than communism even was then. So you can look at this one of two ways at the argument I'm making. You can look at it uh, based on my positive premise. Terrorism isn't so dangerous, as a matter of fact, as to justify the sort of restraint that the court upheld in Holder. Or you can look at it on a more theoretical level and say, even if we conclude that terrorism is a bigger threat than I'm saying it is, a truly free society has no choice but to indulge a certain amount of uh, existential danger because if you immediately suspend free speech rights when existential danger arises, then free speech rights don't mean very much. The government is going to follow its prerogative to declare a national security problem and uh, our right to free speech isn't gonna mean very much. So using my notion of, of, of sort of, we should be promoting dynamic public discourse, I think Holder was wrong. All right, and that's, uh, 
maybe intuitively not so surprising. You know, the government won in Holder. I'm making a free speech argument. I'm saying the government should have lost in Holder. But now let's turn to Citizens United, where I have to make a little bit of a maybe trickier kind of argument to justify my critique. I think Citizens United was wrong too. And here's why. Citizens United, like Holder, in my view, is a case where what the government was doing was promoting and, uh, 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 pardon me let, me, let me take a step back from that. Citizens United, like Holder, is a case where what the court did essentially promoted and entrenched the political status quo. And here's why I say that about Citizens United. The, the, the big argument that the challengers made and the court majority made in Citizens United was money essentially promotes political change. Money in politics allows for meaningful opposition to the government. Without allowing moneyed interests to challenge government policies, uh, we don't have a very effective basis for uh, electoral challenges to government policies. We need to sort of allow power to attack power. I think the basic premise of that argument is wrong, is specious. I think that money uh, in our society is the basis for power. I mean, it's not rocket science. We have a capitalist economy with, with a measure, strong measure of regulation. Uh, but we don't have a lot of, uh, you know, obviously political conflict takes all kinds of forms, but we don't have a lot of big moneyed interests, you know, trying to, to push the rock up the Sisyphean mountain or, you know, challenge, you know, at the barricades. I mean, the moneyed interests are in Congress. They are in the White House. They, they have access. They have opportunities to influence the process. They're not the, 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 the sort of uh, out group when it comes to elections. I, I think it's much more plausible to say uh, what the dissenters in Citizens United said, which is that uh, controlling, regulating money in politics is a way of destabilizing the status quo rather than a way of promoting the status quo. Now, I want to be clear, I may be wrong about this. And the dissenters in Citizens United may be wrong about this. I'm, I'm, I'm offering another sort of uh, positive premise for my normative evaluation uh, about the, uh, the effect that money will actually have on politics. Uh, but it's a premise that, while I may be wrong, I'm reasonably comfortable uh, advancing. So I want a First Amendment law that promotes uh, dynamic public discourse and in the case of, of uh, Citizens United and a lot of campaign finance law beyond Citizens United, I think that value is better served by imposing certain regulations on money in politics than on allowing money to flow freely in politics. Uh, the majority in Citizens United said we can never trust the government to regulate elections uh, because the government, by definition, is up for election. And, and, and I think that's a serious argument. I would never say that we should have a, a First Amendment doctrine that, that just blithely ignored whatever Congress decided to do about money and politics. I think we need that sort of regulatory discussion to be out in the open. I think the court needs to take a serious look as to any given regulation of money and politics at whether that regulation does, in fact, entrench uh, rather than destabilize the status quo. But I think that should be the normative rubric that the court applies. Does this regulation allow, assist, promote meaningful opposition to entrenched power, however we might define that idea. And I just think entrenched power uh, is, is uh, consistent with and, and adjoined to entrenched money. All right. If you're with me so far, now I'm going to just completely jump off the, the train of coherence because I don't know what to do about Martinez. And, and here's why. I think there are two stories in Martinez that are very plausible, opposing stories. One I'm more normatively sympathetic with for other reasons, but that's not a good enough reason to, to take a side on the First Amendment conflict. So one story says gays and lesbians are uh, numerically, politically, socially uh, an oppressed minority group in the United States. Uh, they don't have the same opportunities, uh, assuming they're open about their identities, that uh, other people, straight people, have to participate in social institutions and public discourse. So what the University of California Hastings was doing in, uh, in the Martinez case was valuable in opening up, uh, expanding the scope of public discourse, letting a, a group of people who are uh, an outgroup, essentially, have a greater opportunity to participate in organizations within the university. Uh, that's good. That's, that promotes the university's educational mission. And we can, you know, assuming we uh, 
uh, follow the basic premise that, that gays and lesbians shouldn't face discrimination, should participate in public discourse. We should applaud what the university is doing. The other story, though, is, well, look, we're talking about gays and lesbians at a public university in California. And that's a different context than gays and lesbians in American society. Uh, you're talking about a state and a kind of institution, public education, that is generally very favorable to outgroups. It is entirely plausible to suggest that uh, sincere, probably generally conservative, religiously and politically conservative Christians are uh, facing a, a, a sort of more difficult uh, time at the University of California Hastings College of Law than gays and lesbians are. So by rejecting what the university is doing here, we would really be fostering a meaningful kind of expanded, again, expanded participation, uh, allowing a group that might otherwise ha have a hard time getting its voice heard uh, to do so. And note that both of those arguments, as I've just framed them, partake of this normative value that I'm pitching of, of dynamic public discourse. The thing for me that's harder about Martinez than about either Holder or Citizens United is that I have a harder time coming up with settling on my positive premise. What do I think is the state of the world uh, from which I can then proceed to make a normative argument? I am, to be perfectly frank, much more sympathetic uh, because of my politics and, and my ideals and whatever else to the argument that we should help the gays and lesbians um, and, and that they face a more difficult uh, time. But uh, the other argument, which has been advanced very cogently by a colleague of mine named John Inazu at the law school, uh, is one that I feel that I take very seriously. I mean, I think it, if, if the premise is right, if, to be blunt, it's tougher to be a conservative Christian at the University of California Hastings College of Law than it is to be gay, then the value, the normative value that I'm advancing should uh, cut in favor of striking down what the university did. So in closing, uh, I hope this has been of some interest, and, and I just want to suggest what the takeaway might be. Uh, First Amendment law is harder and First Amendment theory and free speech as a value, I think is, is harder to wrap your hands around than maybe we often acknowledge. Uh, I don't think that promoting free speech is, is simply served by saying the free speech claim should always prevail. I mean, there was a free speech claim in, in, in Citizens United that I don't think should have prevailed. And I'm, in making that argument, I don't think I'm arguing against free speech. I think I'm arguing for free speech. I think I'm arguing that the First Amendment claim in that case did not adequately consider uh, all of the free speech values that were at stake. I think further that these terms I've suggested, this dichotomy I've suggested of pluralism versus integrationism is helpful in understanding what's going on in these cases, but I think it's incomplete because it's a descriptive dichotomy. It helps you look at what's going on in a particularly, I hope, useful way, but it still leaves you needing some additional tool, some additional uh, filter through which to make your own judgments about the propriety of these decisions. I think that filter necessarily is normative, which is a problematic thing for law, but such is life. Uh, and you know, to the extent you feel like agreeing with me that what we should be promoting is dynamic public discourse, that's great. But mainly I encourage you to, as you're thinking about this stuff, isolate your own normative value at that point in the analysis and see what you think about these cases, about what the Supreme Court does in this area. So with all of that, I thank you very much for your kind attention, and I would be delighted to uh, field questions, uh, verbal abuse, whatever is in your mind. Thank you. Sir. Yeah, and this really, I mentioned uh, my friend, colleague, John Inazu, who's written a really good book uh, where he makes a, a very, very sophisticated argument in favor of the autonomy of groups within civil society. And he sees the flashpoint uh, of that issue as having to do with, with anti-discrimination laws. Uh, he says, look, we, we've, we've got this conflict between anti-discrimination laws and groups that want to discriminate, and that is the hardest point for vindicating group autonomy because most of us really dislike discrimination as a general matter. But he says we should swallow hard and allow for that to, even, even for that discrimination by private groups to go on because pluralism is so important, because it's so important to have, have uh, groups uh, 
uh, of all kinds, of all flavors, with all kinds of ideas, participating in, in public discussion. And, and I, I have a great deal of, 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 of sympathy and, and common ground with a lot of what John is saying, but I think one of the hard things about his argument, one of the things that, that gets me off the train, is the problem that you're suggesting, that, that I have a hard time, John sort of is portraying non-discrimination law as, you know, this is the state, this is the heavy hand of the state. And I'm thinking, well, okay, in a certain sense it is, but it's the heavy hand of the state doing something that I don't consider very heavy handed. It's the heavy hand of the state helping groups that are uh, in difficult straits. And often, I think as a matter of, of normative political theory, we think about that as a different kind of function at the state. It's, it's not you know, like the state taxing us or something. It's the state having been, it's the, the better angels of the state, I suppose. Um, and you know, John wants to sort of stop the normative analysis at, at we got to value and respect group autonomy. And I think he's right that that's an important premise, but I also think there's more to non-discrimination than oh, this is the heavy hand of the state and therefore we must be arrayed against it. So it's an incredibly difficult problem and a problem that, that's, that comes up uh, a lot in, in constitutional theory and, and you know, well worth thinking about. I saw a hand high up, yes sir. Well, I, I guess one way of saying it would be I pulled it out of my ear because it's, it, 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 so it, it doesn't come from, part of what I'm arguing here is that it's a normative premise. I mean, I'm, it's, it's not unique to me, I'll say that much. It, to, to the extent your question sort of goes to, you know, is anybody actually credible saying this? Yeah, I mean, there are people I can point to who are making a similar kind of argument. Um, and there are, you can certainly find, I mean, if you go into the great texts of, of free speech theory, you can certainly find support for this idea. I mean, you can find uh, in important First Amendment decisions, in the writings of you know, people like John Stuart Mill, uh, Alexander Mickeljohn, you can, you can see support for the idea. But I do not mean to suggest that that normative idea has a better pedigree than any opposing normative idea. I simply, I, I, part, of, part of my point is I can't argue that because we get to a certain point in this analysis where we just need to argue about what's important. And, and, and so for example, something that I meant to mention in, in my talk, and I'll use this as an occasion to do it, and I think Citizens United was wrong, but I do think there are places within uh, election law and, and, and the sort of intersection between free speech and election law where we should favor pluralism in a way that we don't. And a big example for me is the regulation of political parties. We have, not as a constitutional matter, but as a matter of statutes and tradition, a two-party duopoly. And I think there's a lot that's bad about that. The argument raised on behalf of why the duopoly is good, why it's good to have political ideas filtered into basically these two coalitions, is that it promotes stability, that uh, without that sort of arrangement, you get into political chaos. And hey, we're a society, you know, we're, I affectionately sometimes think of the United States as a, a Frankenstein society. You know, we're patched together from, from other pieces. We're not an ancient culture. Um, so it's very easy for dis you know, disagreement to erupt in this society, so we promote political stability. That is an argument that's sort of opposed to mine, or a premise that's sort of opposed to mine, and I would characterize it the same way. I'll, I could sit here for hours and tell you why I think we should favor dynamism over stability at the margin, but I could not purport to tell you that, that the, uh, again, the pedigree of the stability argument is any stronger or weaker than the pedigree of my dynamism argument. You, 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 get, you sort of dig down and you get to a certain point where you know, the shovel of description ceases to be useful and the jackhammer of normative analysis becomes essential if you're going to move forward in, in, in what you're thinking. Yes, sir. Are you thinking about that idea just in the context of these First Amendment disputes, or are you thinking about it in the legal system more generally? Well, 
I, I, hope the, I hope the thoughts that this is prompting in me are gonna be responsive, and if they're not, you please tell me and I'll, tr I'll try, to, try to do better. Um, let me take a step back and, and, and talk about something I think is, is problematic about resolving these issues through constitutional adjudication by courts. Constitutional law, the, the law of constitutional rights in particular, is built on a very definite structure. The government is always the putative bad guy and the rights holder has to be not the government. The rights holder has to be some private person, some private entity. So in any First Amendment case, as in the ones I described, you're always gonna have some non-government entity saying the government is violating my rights and the court is going to view the First Amendment value or the First Amendment conflict in a binary way. Either the First Amendment prevails or the First Amendment doesn't prevail. Either free speech has to win in the person of the private challenger or free speech has to lose. I don't think that's, I, I, I think there are to some extent understandable reasons why the law works that way, not least the text of the Constitution sort of uh, requires it. But I think it is, it's, it's really limiting if what you're trying to do is optimize some free speech bottom line, whatever, whatever you want. You know, you're, you're, if you think free speech should promote human flourishing, if you think free speech should promote dynamic social change, if you think free speech should promote uh, stability through discourse, whatever unless you are a pure formalist and you say it is perfectly coherent and sufficient to, re to say that the government should not do anything to regulate speech, you need to attend to a bottom line. And by the way, if you're a pure formalist, you run into problems too, and here's why. Here's the other problem that I think comes up. I think that there are a lot of disputes where there are indeed First Amendment values on both sides of the dispute. I think campaign finance is an obvious example. We frame the campaign finance issue as First Amendment unregulated money versus putative bad guy government regulation of money, but I don't think that's right. I mean, my whole point about uh, Citizens United is that I think if the court had gone the other way, it would have promoted free speech. I think sometimes the government is not the bad guy um, because I think we got other bad guys in the society. Like sometimes moneyed interests are powerful too. I think power is to be wary of, but I don't think the government is always the only entity with power that you should be concerned about. So all of that, mishmash is just to say that I think you're really onto something when you suggest, as, as I hear you suggesting, that there's something about legal adjudication that doesn't do justice uh, to these issues. I haven't thought ever, so I'm just starting to think at this moment, my wheels are turning about the kind of alternative that, that, that you're suggesting, and I'm not quite sure where it goes. I mean, I'm, I'm a narrow law guy. So when I've made arguments about this stuff, I've always said, here's how courts should do things differently. Courts shouldn't be so fixated on this public-private distinction. Courts should see that there are First Amendment interests on, on both sides of certain cases in, in, in both speech and, and law and religion contexts. Um, but as to whether some other institution would be better served to do that, it's entirely possible. I mean, I, I, I do think, we, we think of courts as you know, they're not supposed to promote a value. Court isn't supposed to acknowledge, here's the normative, you know, basis for our decision. They do it, but they, you know, they submerge it because we all want judges to be calling balls and strikes, which I think is kind of unreasonable. Um, so could you change it institutionally? Maybe so, but I, I have a hard time, again, this may just be my narrow legal perspective. I have a hard time seeing a resolution of these problems not being grounded in constitutional principles at, at some level. So you, I guess what I'm saying is you're gonna have authority. You know, at the, end, at, at the end of the analysis, you gotta have some grounded authority for resolving on whatever grounds you're gonna do it, resolving disputes. And, and I don't know if a, an institutional shift would, uh, would alter the problems that that irreducible reality creates in any way. I'm not sure, I wanna think about it more. Uh, I'll get over on the other side of the room, yes sir. Yeah. And how do you, is that a kind of a pure form of power? And if, if it is, it's obviously a greater power because it can control this entrenched money that you're so concerned about. Well, now that's, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go. So what is the nature of this pure power? All right, this is great because it's really hard. Let, let, me, let, me, let me start by picking on the, one of the last things you said. That, that, I'm gonna paraphrase badly, but essentially that ultimately state power is superior to money power because state has the power to regulate. 
the funny thing is, as a matter of, uh, I guess, just quantitative, well, I don't want to say quantitative because I actually don't know how to use numbers in any meaningful way, but as a matter of, of sort of, again, positive premise, often the money outfoxes the state. Uh, you know, the, the, one, of the, one of the cliches, and this to me is actually the biggest, I'm, I'm a, a generally a pro-regulation guy in campaign finance, but the biggest problem with my own position that I have to acknowledge is an empirical problem, which is that money often outsmarts the state and is faster than the state. I mean, you're right, the state has superior power in an absolute sense, but congressional action is cumbersome. I mean, my goodness, the years that it took, the iterations that it took to get McCain-Feingold passed, it was, you know, only, only health care. Is 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 more has been more of a sort of cumbersome, difficult slog for for Congress than than campaign finance regulation. So while all that slog is going on. There are incredibly smart people who don't have to answer to voters who are out there thinking about how can I get my client's money where it needs to go without violating this law. Um, you know, smart wash you train lawyer types who are out there out there making those thinking those thoughts. So as to which of these power sources is really more, uh, more effective in wielding its power? I think that's a harder question. But I, nonetheless, having picked that nit, I, I, I take your point very seriously. And I guess at, at one level, there's no way, I mean, we're talking about the conduct of elections in a society, you know, elections that determine who's gonna have political power. There is no way to exclude power, to rope off power from that process. I just don't think that can happen. All right, so I'm saying we should choose at, at the margin uh, government power in favor of, uh, government power rather than the power of entrenched money. But I am also saying, to hedge my bets a little bit, uh, that, we, that courts should do not what the Citizens United Court did, which is say this is absolutely a First Amendment slam dunk on, in the majority's view, but should say, let us searchingly review these campaign finance regulations uh, with the concern in mind that the government is made up of people who have an interest in getting reelected to make sure that they are not, for example, regulating the way that entrenches incumbents. That's why I like courts. I mean, I don't always like courts and what they do, but in a, system, in, a, in a moment like this where it's like, okay, it's big money versus big government, you know, rather than just default to one or the other, uh, let's try to come up with some institutional structure that lets us prevent either of those power centers from, from having too much sway over the process. And I think an allowance for regulation with all of its inherent, you know, again, all of Congress's inherent inefficiencies and, and, and the relative openness of the legislative process. I mean, there's a lot of public debate about, about McCain-Feingold. You put that together with responsible judicial review that treats the, the uh, baseline for resolving those cases is more of a middle ground thing. You know, let's let Congress do some things, but not everything. To me, that's the best I can come up with in terms of a system that doesn't let anybody run the table. Um, so, so if we accept the premise that nobody should run the table and, and, and be able to sort of, you know, no power center should be able to dictate the conduct of elections, that's the, 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 the basis on which I'm making that, that pitch. And again, as I acknowledge, it may, it may be wrong. Uh, all we can do is, is well, in the Supreme Court majority, I'm sure, is doing the same thing. We do the best we can and see what happens. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, so what you've done here is, is, is uh, hit the, the case, you know, I figured it, I'd take an hour talking about this stuff. So the other case I was going to talk about, but I didn't talk about, was a case called Snyder versus Phelps involving the notorious uh, Fred Phelps and his church that goes around to military funerals and funerals of kids who have been murdered and says this is all because God hates us because we 
uh, uh, support homosexuality and these soldiers deserve to die and these children deserve to die because we're a morally corrupt nation. Um, and so to me, I think, I, I hope that's a pretty good example of what you're talking about. I mean, this is about the most appalling, uh, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable just sitting in my own skin, not as a con law professor, but as a person, saying just about the most worthless, uh, disgusting speech that, that I am aware of that anybody has at least said loudly uh, in, in recent times. I mean, just, just hideous. And what you're suggesting, I think, and again, tell me, I'm going to spiel, spiel some stuff and then tell me if I'm hitting it or if I'm missing what you're, what you're talking about. Um, you know, that, to allow that speech, to protect that speech under the First Amendment is about as pluralist friendly as you can get. I mean, we're, you know, we're talking about ideas that virtually nobody agrees with and, and, and not ideas that, that like, if we thought about them more, you know, maybe we'd agree with just ideas that have pretty much been rejected. I mean, we're used to old school, intolerant, hardcore, uh, religious or politically based bigotry and, and, and mo we've rejected that as a society on a pretty informed basis. So there's an important sense in which I think what you're suggesting that isn't really a meaningful part of discourse. It's, it's just people yelling. But here's why I still say we protect it. Um, I still say we protect it because discourse isn't just about a straight up dynamic where you and I are talking to each other and listening to each other. It's also about all of us listening to what's going on around us, observing the world, and, and, and evaluating in different ways what we think is going on. One simple, so another, another sort of way to frame this paradigm is, is hate speech. Um, you know, we're talking about hate speech. Now, there are certain extremes or certain circumstances in which our system does allow for regulation of what we would colloquially refer to as hate speech, but, but not because it's hate speech. So the biggest example is threats. If you go up to someone and make a uh, racially or gender or sexual orientation tinged threat, I'm going to hurt you because you're whatever, you know, Asian, gay, Jewish, that isn't allowed. And the reason that isn't allowed is because the First Amendment isn't supposed to allow you to, uh, to sort of do what, that, what those words do. What they say, I hate Asians, gays, Jews, whoever, you can say that, but you can't use that as an aggressive act. And speech action distinction is a tough one to parse, I recognize that, but that's, that's sort of what the law does. But when it comes to just advocacy of hateful ideas, we, we protect that. So one thing that I think is the most obvious benefit of allowing that protection, well, there, there are two pretty obvious ones, but one I like better than the other. The, the one that I like a little bit less well is the slippery slope argument, that, that you know, if we start saying you can ban this, then you can ban that. Well, I, I think that's right up to a point, but I also think we're not dummies. I think that we, we're capable as a society of framing uh, standards that would allow us not to go from banning Fred Phelps to banning uh, Newt Gingrich. Um, I think we can handle that, probably. The benefit, though, that I do think, okay, think of it fondly for a minute, and then let's move on. Uh, I think the, 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 the concrete benefit of allowing hateful speech is that it brings those ideas out in the open. I mean, one of the, the, the ways of sort of framing a core free speech notion is you shouldn't ban people for the, the ban, punish people for the thoughts that are in their head. And, and that, that may be right as a, a, an ethical matter, but I think it's also right as a practical matter. The thoughts that are in people's heads are going to remain in people's heads. You actually can't stop that from happening. Even if you put those people in prison, uh, you can't stop that from happening as witness the proliferation of, of you know, Aryan groups in, in prisons, right? So. If you let Fred Phelps say what Fred Phelps is going to say, and you know you make him stand back beyond where the funeral is, so that the mourners can hear each other and, and, and have their you know have their conversation, because again we don't want cacophony. But you let you let Phelps do his appalling stuff. We know who those people are. We know where they are. We know what they think, and we can decide what we think about that. And not just we disagree, because we've all pretty much figured that out. But what should we do about it? Where did these ideas come from? Why is it that this particular notion, God hates us because we tolerate gay lifestyles, has, has, has flourished to at least a sufficient extent that there's some people out there yelling it loudly? Thinking about all of that stuff is valuable for figuring out uh, how we want our political culture to, to be. Um, now, having said that, there's also you know, there's cultural frames for this. I mean, in, in Europe, I had a chance to, to do a, teach a short course in Europe, in, in the Netherlands. In Europe, you can't have a Nazi political party. I get that. I mean, sometimes we say, you know, in our 
puff up our chest in the United States and say only our First Amendment you know, norms are, are, are enough to promote freedom. Well, the Netherlands is a pretty free country. I mean, I, I, I didn't really notice any jackbooted thugs uh, except you know, at the soccer games. So, um, so I think you can do that, you know, and I get why they do it. I mean, they were occupied by freaking Nazi Germany. Of course, of course you have that, that regulation. We're fortunate in that we weren't occupied by Nazi Germany, so we can do this our way, and I think on balance it's better to allow that speech than to restrict it. Yes? I'm just Yeah. 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 Uh, this gets into the whole like culture versus universal human rights norms debate, and and I, it's a very hard debate for me because I'm you know I'm a I'm a typical U.S. civil libertarian, so I like to think that there are universal norms that should be honored. And I argue, you know, I'll argue in a lot of contexts pretty hard, as I'm sure uh, many or most of you will, that, that there are certain things that are just uh, wrong. And, and the culture, you know, I, I don't, I'm not gonna be sympathetic if, if somebody from Saudi Arabia says, you know, here's why we put these restrictions on what women can do. I'm, I'm sorry, but I just don't see the, I can't, you know, you're gonna do what you're gonna do and there's nothing I can do about it, but I think it's wrong and I'm gonna tell you so politely at least. Um, but I do think, you know, the experience, sort of seeing the perspective of the Netherlands, I mean, again, these people value free expression as much as we do, and Canada has certain restrictions that we don't have. So, okay, so we're talking about the Netherlands and Canada, then you get to freaking Rwanda, and yeah, I, I, I get that. And, and I think, I mean, I, I think protection, oh, it's so hard. I mean, like development of, of, of norms of rights is, is a dynamic process. You know, ultimately, the reason you have rights protections is to is to stop something that would otherwise happen. So by definition, you're resisting a tendency within the society that's, that's, that's feeding what the government is gonna do. Um, and I've said, you know, we should indulge existential threats. But I gotta say, an existential threat to the United States is a very different idea fundamentally than an existential threat to Rwanda. Because, and, and, and for that matter, an existential threat to the Netherlands. Because these countries have, have been virtually destroyed. Um, and maybe push to the brink, I would say the right thing to do is for you guys to be more fully tolerant of radical expression and we should come up with a way, you know, for the UN to have rapid response teams to help out when that goes horribly wrong. Um, and by the way, I'm, I would say, you know, the, one of the, Rwanda provides one of the great examples of speech that is not and should not be protected, and that's the government getting on the radio and saying, go slaughter your neighbors. I mean, that's what we call incitement to imminent lawless action uh, in our dry way, and it is certainly not protected by the First Amendment. But even advocacy in a, in a powder keg like that uh, can, can, yeah, result in, in bloodshed. Uh, I'd like to think that there's a way of handling that that doesn't, you know, again, regulating advocacy is easier than you know, getting enough cops on the street to push people apart and knowing that the cops will do their job the right way and all that good stuff. That's my ideal. Um, but where that's not possible, I'm not gonna be the one to, to yell at people for, you know, for not living up to my ideal because ultimately who the hell cares what I think. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's a, this is actually a, a, an issue that's, there have been a couple of recent, it's a long, long time Supreme Court line of cases dealing with this and, and, and it may be about to heat up even more. So the basic problem is uh, you've got uh, a, a state that allows for uh, mandatory union membership and the union requires payment of dues and part of those union dues go to political advocacy, most obviously on behalf of particular candidates, usually Democratic candidates. So you've got a Republican who joins the union because he wants to or because she has to or whatever. 
and that person says, okay, I want, you know, whatever the union is, what it is, uh, being made to join the union as a collective bargaining unit is one thing, but being forced through my dues to support candidates whom I oppose, perhaps very vehemently, is uh, another thing altogether. And so the Supreme Court, um, back in the 70s, said that there's got to be some division, some bifurcation of union dues, and that you can union members have to be able to opt out uh, through some mechanism of the, the political portion. Uh, so somebody's got to come in, audit, figure out, okay, how much of the dues is going to collective bargaining, how much of it is going to uh, political advocacy, and the dissenter has to be able to forego or you know, not, not foot the bill for the political advocacy. I think that's a pretty good resolution of the problem. Um, now, others, including, I suspect, a majority of the Supreme Court disagree. I mean, the, the, the most critical position of, of mandatory union dues is that even, you know, particularly if you take money seriously as speech, which is obviously a premise of Citizens United, that even requiring union dues for collective bargaining and, and you know, just ordinary supporting workers in, in uh, immediate ground level ways, even requiring that, one argument would say, violates the First Amendment, which is a short step from saying requiring union membership violates either the First Amendment or some other rights principle, maybe substantive due process. Um, I don't see that. I mean, again, I think it's something that has to be thought through and taken seriously. Uh, but I think for a state to require union membership and to require support of um, collective bargaining efforts is a reasonable sort of regulation of liberty. I mean, it's, it's in that zone where the government gets to tax us. Um, I mean, that's a little easier because it's in the Constitution, I concede. But um, I, I, I think that sort of manda allowing mandatory union membership and, and union dues for collective bargaining is, is in that category. But I do think that, that the, um, the case called Abud, the Abud problem of, of separating out the union dues and the, the, the political part and the uh, collective bargaining part and the union dues is, is valid. And then you get into sort of fine-grained arguments about should it be an opt-out or an opt-in? Is the accounting proper? What happens if the union, there's a case last year to just make your head spin about the union charges a special assessment uh, in between nor normal dues periods, and there's a certain accounting problem that happens with that special assessment that we don't know how much of it went to politics. How should we strike the balance? I mean, there's a lot to talk about. But on the basics, I think the, I think the, the resolution the, the court has come up with for a long time is, is, is a valid one. Right. And so the students could say, well, I'm having to support an income group by doing my tuition. Right. So would you have to take a portion of the tuition away from the students if they don't want to give money to this group? The question is, um, wouldn't the same critique I just had about union dues apply to a situation like Martinez where you've got people being compelled to support a discriminatory organization? Shouldn't they be able to prorate that? And, and I guess a difference. I mean, it's a really good question. And this sort of res uh, uh, reconciliation of uh, conscientious objection of various kinds with uh, government authority is, is a tricky one. One way, I guess, to justify the, uh, the Abud thing, the, the union dues bifurcation, is that the, go the government there is basically requiring a certain kind of interaction between the individual worker and a, a private entity, the union. And so uh, that government regulation that sort of locks you in to that, you know, if you want to work in this industry, if you want to be a pipe fitter, you got to be in the pipe fitters union, uh, carries with it certain uh, obligations to respect rights. I think that's how the argument would go. The difference, I'm not sure I'm even going to be able to, it's, it's a great question. I may not be able to answer it as, co as coherently as I'd like. The difference in the uh, university setting is that, yes, it's government power, um, but the government is fostering, as part of the university's educational mission, a multiplicity of viewpoints. So we're all tied together. It's not a question of, okay, if you're a Republican, you know the union is going to act against your political interests. If you're a, a gay rights liberal 
or uh, traditional values Christian, the assurance that you have going to the University of California Hastings is that your position will be uh, uh, presented and, and fostered and the opposing position will be presented and fostered because the university's mission is uh, promoted diversity of viewpoints. And the, the, there's a, an earlier case, uh, University of Wisconsin case called Board of Regents versus Southworth that, that raises exactly the argument you're saying, shouldn't students be, student activity fees be either banned or prorated? And the, the court's kind of answer to that is, look, the only way you can satisfy everybody, it's kind of like if you did it with taxes, you know, like I, I oppose the Iraq war, I shouldn't have to pay for it. There's a good ethical argument for that, but if you do that, then everybody gets to opt out and we're left with, uh, we're left with nothing. We're left with, you know, we don't agree about anything. I mean, maybe the university would be able to support the, you know, be kind to children in a non, uh, you know, non-sectarian way club. But besides that, th there wouldn't be much left. So the idea is that, that if the government is, is, is as a, for a, a reason like education, promoting a multiplicity of viewpoints, what the court in Southworth basically told the objectors is you're not supporting the position that opposes you, you're supporting pluralism of a certain kind. Um, and the court says that's okay, it's okay for the university to require that. Now, having said that, the case has not yet come up, but it's gonna, I mean, there, there have been certainly cases, free speech cases involving the Nazis and the Klan, but you know, there, I don't know of a case where it's like the university of whatever Klan club being a part of that. Like, you know, there's a point where our convictions get pushed. Uh, and I don't think, I don't think CLS versus Martinez is, is, is quite that case for most people, even most people who disagree with what the Christian Legal Society is doing. But so I, what I mean to say is, I'm, I'm happy to tell you about Southworth and say that that's a good decision and justify that pluralism thing. Um, but as a practical matter, and maybe ultimately as a normative matter, you know, there may be limits to that. I mean, there may be a point where, because partially what the court's saying in Southworth is again, look, you're not, nobody's endorsing a particular point of view. You're insulated from that conceptually. Uh, but it's harder to say that when the plural, plurality of views contains something that really sets people off. Uh, and I don't know, maybe, maybe that case comes out a different way. I, I don't think it should, but it's easy to say that in the abstract. Okay, I thought you were going to ask me about uh, the contraception thing, and you asked me about the drone thing. That's a curveball. I was waiting for the contraception question after that whole conscientious objection thing. Uh, the drone thing. Okay, first caveat, I am not an international lawyer. I'm not an international human rights expert. I'm just a guy, you know, who knows something about the Constitution. Um, I think the administration's position is extraordinarily difficult to swallow and extraordinarily difficult to... Uh, to accept. And the administration is basically saying, we, based on an internal finding uh, that a target poses some threat, and it doesn't have to be an active planning of terrorist activity, it can be, uh, I don't know what it's supposed to be from the, from the memo that, that the administration let out, but if we decide the person's a threat, we can take them out. I just don't see how that's consistent with democracy, human rights, uh, much of anything that I value. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not real nuanced on this question. I, 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 I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm willing, I'm willing to sort of not be a total pacifist. I mean, I think if somebody's coming at you with a grenade, you shoot them, and if you know that they're sitting out there with the grenades waiting to come at you and there's nothing else you can do but shoot them, you shoot them, okay, fine. But um, long distance, I mean, there's all kinds of problems with the drone thing, obviously. It's, it's great because it doesn't involve uh, people on your side getting killed, but it makes it really easy to kill people on the other side. There's collateral damage. Um, even though these people are very, apparently very good at what they do, uh, they've missed a fair number of times. But the biggest problem from a constitutional standpoint is, you're asking about the administration's position. I think the administration's position is appalling. I mean, you're talking about 
And I don't care whether we're talking about American citizens or somebody else. You're, you're saying we can do targeted assassination based on flimsy findings that are unreviewable by any, uh, any neutral magistrate. That, uh, you know, it just boggles my mind. So, you know, I, 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 it's, it, that's, that's all I got. Thank you all very much.